are Juana Doboshi and Raluca Selejan from a two hours bookshop from Timisoara, Romania. We are honored and more than happy to host today this online event about the written world and the world literature from A to Z. We opened our independent bookshop three years ago because we wanted to create a place, a meeting place between books and people. As we all know, the heart of the publishing houses is their catalog. And we think that the heart of the bookshops is their geography of the entire offer. That's why our bookshop is focused on literary fiction, poetry, humanities, art, and children books. We are here today with Dr. Delia Ungureanu, Assistant Director of Harvard's Institute for World Literature and Associate Professor of Literary Theory in the Department of Literary Studies at the University of Bucharest. She has just finished her third book, Time Regained, World Literature and Cinema, that will be published by Bloomsbury. And together with Giselle Sapiro, she is the co-editor of a special issue of the Journal of World Literature dedicated to the memory and legacy of Pascal Casanova. And she is also our moderator for today. So hello, Delia, and thank you for being here. Hey, thank you. Uh, Professor David Demrosh, Chair of Department of Comparative Literature, Ernest Birnbaum, Professor of Comparative Literature and Director at the Institute for World Literature at Harvard University, uh, where he started the book project Around the World in 80 Books, which you can find online on the Institute's website. He just published this past March his new book, Comparing the Literatures, with Princeton University Press, and he is currently working on a book on the role of global scripts in the formation of national literatures. Hello, Professor David Demrosh, and thank you for being here. Professor Martin Puckner, Byron and Anita Vien Professor of Drama and of English and Comparative Literature at Harvard University. He is also the author of the book, among others, the Written World, The Power of Stories to Shape People, History, Civilization, book translated into Romanian, and one of the bestsellers of our independent bookshop. Hello, Professor Martin Pugner, and thank you to you two for being here today with us. In, my March, pleasure. I'm when, delighted. Uh, in March, when the pandemic and the lockdown came, uh, we had to close the door of our bookshop, but we opened the window so people could still buy books from us, and we also realized that this is the time we must have an online shop on our website to keep up with everything that is happening. The best sellers of an independent bookshop is always different from the big bookstore chain. And they also reflect the reading habits of the community created around them. We decided to put on the website the best sellers from our bookshop and our recommendations also. We wanted to create a story to sell the stories we trust most. Story that starts with a map and is called with 94 books to Ithaca. Our summer journey begins with Homer's Odyssey and ends up with Daniel Mendelssohn's An Odyssey. And you can find more details about it on our website. And we are more than happy that three maps of literature are bringing us together today. Our web website map, as Juana told you about, which will be available in English in the next couple of days. The map of the written world created by Martin Puckner from the book, The Written World, The Power of Stories to Shape People, History and Civilizations. And the map of the book project around the world in 80 books made by David Demrosh. Thank you again. We made it at Adelia's instigation by our graphic designer for the Institute, <laughs> Smaranda Moraros. So it's a Romanian uh, map design. Yeah. Uh, thank you again to the three of you for being here with us today. Thank you for watching our online event. And we want to also invite you, our viewers, to ask questions in the comment section of this live event because our guests are happy to answer them. So Delia, the mic is yours. 
Thank you so much, Juana and Raluca, for this uh, most warm welcome. And especially thank very much Martin and David for uh, accepting this, this invitation. I do believe uh, we, we share a lot of things here uh, and not just the passion for maps. Uh, I would like to uh, begin by saying that um, in addition to the maps you just outlined, I also believe that you, with your bookstore at Two Owls, are uh, putting Timisoara and also Romania on the map of uh, independent bookstores in the same tradition as uh, Adrienne Monnier's uh, La Maison des Amis des Livres and, of course, Sylvia Beach's Shakespeare and Company. I think what they did for Paris, you're definitely doing for Romania. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we are here today uh, with two of the people who are uh, writing the uh, history of the discipline of world literature, uh, David Amrush and Martin Puchner, who really need actually no introduction. Uh, they have been instrumental uh, to the field on so many levels, theoretical, methodological, and also pedagogical. Uh, and I would really say that they are literally tireless in their constant efforts to rethink and reinvent the discipline with an amazing uh, awareness of the challenges that are posed today. Um, their anthologies of world literature are absolutely, uh, literally worldwide uh, spread. I'm thinking of uh, the anthology um, edited by uh, uh, Martin, uh, the Norton Anthology for World Literature, and of course, uh, the Longman Anthology for World Literature, uh, edited by David. Uh, and today we are going to talk about many things, their current projects, their future projects, the uh, uh, state of the discipline a little, and also about the Institute for World Literature. Uh, since you did just uh, uh, give us as task uh, world literature from A to Z, uh, you know, we could try to do a bit of a pale fire, you know, from Appalachia to Zembla back again. So that would be the A to Z. Um, a, uh, a question to, to just, you know, spark the conversation I was thinking would be interesting to, to think about something that I was just discussing a few days ago with Martin about the state of humanities in, in general. And uh, of course, there have been uh, very many concerns over the years, and especially since during the pandemic um, about the, uh, the state of humanities at large. However, I would like to say that uh, the absolutely amazing success that uh, Martin's uh, uh, The Written World and also David's new uh, book project around the world in 80 books uh, are pretty much contradicting this because, um, it, correct me Martin if I'm mistaken, but your book is already translated into 14 languages and counting, right? Uh, and uh, uh, David's project is already available also on six other uh, languages, Romanian included, and uh, already we have uh, two uh, projects projects coming up as book forms uh, in Romania with the help of my friend and colleague Carmen Mushat. Traku Sarte agreed to take on the project, uh, the Romanian version, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Chinese version will be most likely taken by the Shanghai Translation Press. Uh, now, I was wondering whether uh, Martin and David, you could talk a bit starting from this, this point of view on the uh, humanities at large and the particular situation of world literature. Would you say that is it better than ever? David, oh, is this for me? Uh, oh, this, I, I, I hope that David would uh, answer this question. <laughs> You're writing on the humanities now, so. Uh, no, but it's for both of you. It's for both of you. Well, I'll start. It's the best of times and the worst of times. I was just writing on, on Dickens two weeks ago, not the tale of two cities, but that nonetheless. Uh, clearly, the humanities um, are under a great deal of stress. And clearly, we need them more than ever. And I think uh, the success of the Two Owls Bookshop shows this uh, as the projects we're working on. You know, we're, we're, uh, we're very interested, I think, uh, both Martin and I, uh, as all of us with the Institute are, in really uh, not just sort of thinking about globalization in some isolated way, but being out in the world. Uh, and I think uh, we, we all think that uh, Literature is a sort of a privileged way of thinking deeply about things that are otherwise very superficial and other forms of, of discourse. I think the, the hunger that people have, and uh, certainly I'm finding all these responses to these daily blogs, people, you know, it has a psychological effect as well as a kind of intellectual effect, just building a sense of, of community. And I think there's nothing, uh, nothing quite like it. So that's the lead into you, Martin. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I, I agree with, with all of this. I mean, it's interesting if, if, if I just watch my own behavior and, and that, that of others in the last few months, there was, I think, sort of a first phase where we all 
sort of were interested in, oh, what's the pandemic literature or, you know, Boccaccio, even in our class, David, in, in, in early March, we were talking about Boccaccio and so on and so forth, trying to, interesting, this turn to literature to make sense of, uh, um, of what was happening. Uh, then the second phase for me was pure escapism. Uh, in my case, it's Woodhouse. the form of, of reading P.G. Woodhouse. Uh, uh, and it, we share, of course, this uh, uh, interest. Uh, um, and I guess the third phase uh, uh, is just sort of really thinking deeply about the world, as, 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 as you put it, uh, because the, you know, it's a global pandemic and it's been so interesting to see how different countries have reacted to it, both on a technical, uh, uh, but also on a cultural level. And I think that that just highlights, it, it's kind of a, it, it's both parable, but it's also a fascinating case study in, in, in cultural difference, if you will. And, and as you say, literature is a, is a way of thinking about that uh, beyond the headlines and the immediate response. Now, just to continue on, on this particular topic and trying to get closer to your current book projects, um, one of my favorite uh, takes on uh, world literature is actually an essay by you, Martin, the teaching worldly literature that was included in the 2014 Routledge Companion, the one that uh, David edited together with uh, Theo Dan and Jalal Kadir. And I particularly uh, like the way you define their um, World literature is that literature that has a transformative and also revolutionizing effect on the world around us. So I was wondering whether each of you could discuss uh, um, about this particular topic in relation to, to your book, Martin, and also in, in David's case, in relation to the book you just published, the comparing uh, the literatures and also the, the current book he's doing. Um, yes, sure. No, I think that's really true. And I, I mean, I should say, if I think about what led me to write this book, The Written World, David himself had a huge effect uh, on it because it was really Namaste. David who sort of introduced me into to this whole idea of world literature. And, 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 and so I, I, I feel myself following very much in, in his footsteps. Uh, um, but you're right, then that, that, that essay uh, um, uh, about the, the effect of literature on the world. Now, of course, it, it's a little bit of a play on words. Uh, the, the world and world literature usually that just means a kind of global approach or some sort of non-Western approach. But it, it, it did get me thinking about the relation between literature and the world. And I think this is, this is something and that David does very much and that uh, uh, I've adopted as well. And, and I think that led me to my book, The Written World, which is really to think about how, how, does, how does literature uh, shape, shape history uh, uh, and how has it done that? Uh, and the through line I adopted is to see that as a combination of the power of storytelling, and that means certain kinds of stories in, in, uh, influence certain readers. I, I opened with Alexander the Great, who was inspired by Homer to, on his campaign a uh, military campaign to the East. Uh, he kept a copy of, of Homer by his bed uh, throughout his entire campaign. So there's one way. But the other is through um, storytelling technology. So I spent a lot of time thinking about the invention of different scripts, invention of the alphabet, of, of papyrus, paper, and of course, different inventions of print. And then our own internet revolution is one of the uh, ways that 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 helped literature shape the world. So so that so that that's that, that was the trajectory. But I think you're you're absolutely right. It it started with uh, just thinking about literature and the world. And even though that's not usually the meaning of world literature, I think for both David and I, that that became an important uh, way of thinking about it. Well, I think that um, to return the compliment, I would say the current project that I'm working on is very much uh, inspired by Martin's book, uh, which I have read with such, uh, such pleasure. Um, uh, the, the challenge for, for, so Martin and I have both written primarily for 
scholarly audiences. Uh, and actually when Penguin first approached me a few years ago to, to do a book for a general audience, they said, enough world literature already, I've done a lot of that. But I thought, well, I, I haven't really figured out how to do that for a general, general audience so much. Uh, and uh, Martin and I actually started working, agreed on these projects about the same time, but because Martin is actually productive and efficient, uh, he's we published the book already. Uh, I've had a couple because of other published things. published three other books in the meantime. Yeah, yeah well, but you know, exactly, but a little less focused, uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but uh, uh, Martin has such an amazing ability to, I think, combine scholarly seriousness with a very engaging voice. And I think the voice is very, very important. Um, uh, and to me, also one of the things important about world literature, which is also a challenge about reading and translation, is that the so much scholarship is about just the kind of great ideas in the books, which are very wonderful, but, uh, but really it's, it's, it's the voice of the writer uh, that draws us in, ideally. Uh, and I think uh, Martin's, just a further plug from Martin's book, it's, it's really a pleasure to read because his voice comes through uh, so beautifully. I'm just talking about this right now. I'm working on Dante today and, and just, you know, even if your Italian is as bad as mine is, just, you know, it's so good to have a bilingual edition and just hearing that Italian, even if poorly pronounced, is like, there's nothing like it. Uh, and the kind of little drama of the terzo rima you're, you're getting, Nabokov says at one point that the rhyme is the lion's birthday. Uh, and Dante really uh, gives you that. And this, of course, goes as far as, speaking of Homer, uh, Walcott's Omeros, uh, which is, on the one hand, uh, rewriting Homer, of course, but it's in terzo rima form. So it's really rewriting Dante, rewriting Virgil, rewriting uh, Homer. So these kinds of connections have always interested me a lot, but I wasn't quite sure of the narrative from my own, my own project. Like, all right, yes, yeah, it's nice to read a lot. I like to read, but is that really a compelling thing? And then, and then when they, so I was going to do this sort of around 20 or so cities that I've been to and works that I associate with it, but, but it seemed to lack a certain purchase until the virus, the epidemic hit. And I went through these stages of, of grief, my, my version uh, with Martin was describing is, you know, first, it's just like obsession with CNN and with statistics. And I'm uh, here down in Brooklyn, which has been a real epicenter. So like, are, am I hearing one ambulance or two at a given time? It was, you know, constant. Uh, and I was getting very obsessed and kind of depressed about it. And, and this project really, for me, had a psychological benefit thinking, right, well, how have these writers themselves dealt with trauma in their lives, uh, one or another? And then Virginia Woolf, I start with, I mean, not only is she talking about the World War I trauma, of course, behind her, there's a tra trauma of child abuse, but also uh, Clarissa Dalloway has a heart problem because she was sick apparently during the, the virus epidemic in 1918. So there's also, you know, it's, it's everywhere, in fact, even without going as far as uh, uh, Decameron, which I'll be talking about tomorrow in my thing. In fact, uh, we process our world through the literature we read uh, and we can see how the, how the writers themselves have done that. And the thing that really clicked for me was I thinking, well, I was going to go to all these places this, this year and uh, build uh, a number of the chapters around them, and then everything gets canceled. But then I remembered another, so I, had, I was using this uh, Jules Verne around the world in 80, uh, in 80 days for 80 books, but then, then it was another literary model. because so I think of uh, uh, Javier de Maestre, a uh, late 18th century writer who gets, um, well, he's really an army officer. He gets uh, sentenced to house arrest for seven weeks. Uh, after fighting in a duel, and he writes this delightful book, Voyage autour de ma chambre, a journey around, and he treats his, his room as the world. And I thought, that's it. What about this, this question that both of you raised, this uh, writing for an academic versus for a general audience? Which do you really find hardest? Um, I find well, Martin, writing so good for at both, a so. general audience harder yeah. uh, in a good way because I feel like you actually have to figure out things in a more fundamental, I mean, it's harder in several ways. Uh, I think with an academic audience, there are, are a lot of shared assumptions uh, that you can make, that you, but that also those shared assumptions, because you're talking essentially to an in-group, um, also means that you actually yourself don't have to think things through on a fundamental level, because you feel like, oh, the field has already thought these things through. We, sh we share all these assumptions, and so we, we can skip over them. Um, for, for an academic audience, when you can't do that, you have to kind of think things through for yourself. And I think that very fundamental question about how literature shapes the world is 
for me was one of them. So I, I actually found that there are a lot of unexamined assumptions or even shortcuts that you make when you write for a kind of in group um, that you can't make. And so you really have to think through uh, uh, things very fundamentally. And, and then there are certain challenges of, of storytelling. You know, when, when, when you tell a story, you have to think about very basically what the protagonist What's the protagonist of the story? What forms of action? What kind of world? And so on and so forth. And so with the story I was telling in, in the written world, I felt like, oh, wow, I have to actually think through these basic storytelling concepts. What drives the story forward? In academic writing, there's oft, often a lot of sort of uh, passive constructions or the idea that concepts somehow act in the world and, and, and so on and so forth. And I felt like, oh, oh I can't do that. So what, what concrete agent, is it, a, is it a writer? Is it a reader? Is it a librarian? Is it someone who, uh, uh, is it a traveler who moves a text from one place to another? It, is, it, is it someone who uses a new technology in a particular way? All these questions of agency, for example, that, that you know, I would, I, speaking just for myself, not others, I felt like in my own academic writing, I'd often sort of in some sense skipped over because it felt embarrassing or unnecessary uh, or naive or, or I don't know, to actually address them fully. And so I, I find it harder, but, but in, a, in a, you know, in a very meaningful and intellectually really important way. So that, that's been my experience with it. Sorry, I was just looking at for another Another book. Before I forget, since you had such a lovely map, uh, Juan Anrilka, of, uh, of your project, I don't know, you might consider if you don't already have, uh, do you know The Atlas of Remote Islands by Judith Shalansky? Mm. It's an absolutely fantastic book. Uh, the subtitle is 50 Islands I Have Never Set Foot On and Never Will. Uh, and it's a beautiful book. Every, every page, every chapter, she has drawn an island, an actual island, and then she'll tell little anecdotal stories about the island. Very poetic, very mysterious, uh, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, so I, I'll be using this uh, later in my own my own. Very, very invisible cities like David, right? This is invisible islands, and she's making them visible, exactly, and drawing them. It won a, it won a, a, a prize for, for book design as well, and it's been translated into, into many languages. And then there's a map of where the islands are uh, in the end papers. So yeah, I think for myself, this has been a kind of a dialectic process uh, for a while. Um, so I did earlier a trade book on the Epic of Gilgamesh, now whatever it was, 10, 12 years ago. And that was really interesting because I this was a result of a sort of response to the, the first Gulf War. I got, I got so upset about the American discourse about a clash of civilizations. I thought, what do I know about that the world might want to know about that says if you go back far enough, it's actually one civilization. There are cultural differences, but there is not, let's say, a universal, but there actually is a, a civilization there. So I thought, all right, the world needs a book about the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is normally something I'd only written about very much for scholars. So I start uh, telling the story of its discovery, very much like Martin is saying, what, who are the agents that make this come back into the world after 2000 years? Very, very interesting story. And he's also written about it beautifully in his uh, new book. Um, and so I do this, I think I'm telling you, I start out saying, oh, I, you know, it's, it's one of the most dramatic discoveries in the history of archaeology uh, when this was found. Uh, and so I take it around to publishers and the publisher I end up going with, he, he taps the first page with his pen and says, well, this is nice, but couldn't you make it a bit more dramatic? <laughs> I thought I already, because I said it was dramatic, but I didn't dramatize it, right? So th this was like one of these little light bulbs going off over my head, uh, like, like for a character. And I think this has actually helped me in my scholarly writing. So increasingly, I have a more narrative form doing scholarship. So the new book on comparing the literatures is built around memoirs and, and autobiographical essays or undertones in, in scholarship. And I'm very interested in the kind of complicated personalities who become comparatives, who themselves cross borders. Why are they not content with a national tradition in and of itself? What is the dynamic between that? And, and you know, a surprising number of these people have written now little memoirs and sometimes entire books that are very much neglected, but it turns out really, really interesting. So I think there's been a kind of a back and forth. Just one other footnote to that was, I remember talking once a very distinguished medievalist who had uh, just uh, finished a trade book on uh, 
of the Bay, Bayou Tapestries. And he was saying, uh, he's really had trouble working with his publishers because his publishers kept wanting him to dumb it down. And I just thought from that, all right, he doesn't get it. That's not the point. The point is reaching out. And I think his book did not have a great success in the market either. It, it was too much like uh, too many footnotes uh, or, or too many missing footnotes, all of that. <laughs> so it's, I think it is a really, as, as Martin said, a very exciting challenge, quite liberating, I, I find. Uh, and I will say it took me longer to figure out how to do this new project than it took any, because it wasn't self-evident what, what to do with it. And that, that's also part of, part of the fun of writing for an audience that's not being paid to read you. I, I think actually this is uh, uh, really uh, leading to, to my next question, because what I really admire about both of you uh, is how down to earth you are, which I think is something we, we all really need more, how connected to the, the real world you are, which I think really comes out very much in the fact that the pedagogical aspect has always been key to, to the way you think of the discipline and, and the way you do research, uh, as well as uh, in what the institutionalizing of the discipline is concerned. And I'm thinking here that at, at least to me, uh, the best form of institutionalizing this discipline has been this Institute for World Literature that uh, both of you uh, have actually begun in 2011. Uh, David as the director, uh, Martin as uh, a uh, founding member. Uh, and uh, right now we are already a, a decade old and we have something over a thousand alumni. I'm sure more of, many of them are watching us right now. Uh, and I'm sure that they would love to hear uh, what you feel the Institute has has accomplished over the past decade and what are the, the challenges that it faces uh, right now? Because um, I think something that has been uh, on the positive side uh, of the uh, discipline, which I, I interpret it as um, it's a very good way of thinking uh, ahead was the fact that this pandemic that actually forced us to retreat to the online version uh, was actually taken up by all 130 participants who initially uh, were supposed to come to Belgrade. Uh, so uh, the group is intact, despite the fact that we are online and we found that people are very happy to, to be part of it. So I was wondering whether you could talk a bit about um, what is the uh, uh, Institute's place within the discipline, also the, the way it functions and um, how you think it should uh, continue. Well, maybe I'll start on this, on this one. Um, yeah, uh, I first had the idea about doing it uh, a decade or so ago. I've been going around giving talks on world literature, which uh, was very interesting, different places, but it seemed a little bit ephemeral because in so many places, uh, these local universities were not set up to train people. Uh, in, in beyond a national tradition or a very specific subset of comparative uh, studies, which often meant their tradition plus Western Europe and not looking more, more broadly. So I thought, well, if we could have uh, some way to really train people for a month, there's this thing called the School for Criticism in Theory that's been held for decades, which is now at Cornell. And that was kind of a model for me about that. Uh, and I also thought we should be out in the world and not just talk about it so we meet rotationally different, uh, in different places. Uh, and I think very much as, um, as uh, Wano was saying, uh, and we look about the, about the Two Owls Bookshop, it's all about the community. Uh, you, can, you can read an essay uh, and you can read a book, but actually getting together, and especially in the case of people interested in comparative or world literature, there may be only one or two people in their university who have that interest. And so then to get together, and what's particularly interesting to me is that I think uh, I mean, you, you could hope and expect. Uh, it's gratifying that a lot of the participants, graduate students, and also faculty who come uh, to take the, the seminar seem very happy with the community. But equally, I think universally, the people who have taught the seminars say it's been among the most uh, pleasurable experiences. Uh, I don't know, Martin, when you taught for us in Istanbul, if you also had that, that experience as a teacher of it. I mean, it was great. And But let me first say, Delio, uh, uh, it's very kind of you to say that I was somehow part of the founders. It's uh, this is, is not not true. It was really David, and then and then you. I I was sort of a hanger on, but a, an extremely happy hanger on. Uh, uh, and the the Istanbul session, uh, uh, maybe like six seven years ago now, uh, was was a wonderful. Was a relatively early. It was maybe the third or fourth. The second. Uh, the second. Uh, twenty twelve. Twenty twelve. Um, yeah. Um, and. Um, 
it was just great because it was such a fascinating place. Um, it, a, the place that itself is connected to the history of, of world literature uh, uh, for various reasons, among others, in the history of the discipline, because uh, Leo Spitzer and, and Eric Auerbach spent time there before sort of bringing a version of world literature to the United States. Uh, during, this was during World War II. Uh, uh, but also because of the way in Istanbul has always been sitting between Asia and Europe and, and, and all of that. Or Han Pamuk was there. So, it, but also participants from all over the world. Uh, uh, but what 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 I find so great about this concept of the institute taking place in different places around the world is that it's not every time the same sort of cosmopolitan crowd. I mean, there are always people from all over, but it, each session I think has a real local character both in terms of the participants of course because it's easier for local participants to come but also teachers and all the programming that happens around uh, around it so that that i think is is was such a brilliant idea to have the institute uh, move around in, in that way and 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 definitely uh, istanbul was was a good example but i know that every session especially the sessions taking place not in, in, in Cambridge, I had that particular special character. I might add to this uh, particularly nice and unexpected early result uh, uh, has been this um, journal of world literature, which I'm looking for one of my copies. Oh, here we go. I'm moving books around. Uh, of which now the most recent issue is that one mentioned that uh, Dele and Gilles Sapiro have edited and Pascal Casanova just, just hot off the press. But this came out of the Institute unexpectedly. It was two postdoctoral participants uh, who are themselves Iranian emigres uh, studying in Europe. Uh, and they think they want to do a journal. They originally thought of doing a journal on Persian literature, but then coming to the Institute that they needed something broader. So they thought, how about if there'd be a journal of world literature? And they got together with several of us who were teaching uh, and we formed a board uh, and Brill is now publishing it. We're in our, uh, I think, what is it now, fifth year, right? as a quarterly journal. And, and that's thanks to two graduate students who were there. Uh, and then it's a kind of collaborative. There's also really concrete things in the world that uh, have been very satisfying. No, absolutely. And I, I would actually add something to what Martin said. No, Martin, it's, it's really untrue. You have been very important to the Institute. Because... You were on, on, the, on the executive committee at the very beginning, Martin. Yes, and helped us exactly. Formulate it. You're just too modest. That's a problem that I have with Martin. No, 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 and also, and also, it, it's not a widespread problem among Harvard faculty, but it is a particular <laughs> problem with Martin. No, but I was, I was going to say that I, I, I believe this kind of um, very open-minded understanding of what world literature is, you know, this whole transformative revolutionary power that it has, I think it really has been very much at the heart of the way we structure and we organize the program. So in that sense, I, I honestly believe that uh, your view is very much at, at the heart and the center of it. Uh, and I'm, I'm very much, you know, uh, uh, I'm super content that we are doing this uh, today because um, I was also thinking of, um, um, how challenging it is to, to teach online. And yet for you and David, it really doesn't seem to be at all challenging because you did together this uh, amazing uh, online uh, course or the, the Move the Harvard X, right, course, Masterpieces of World Literature. And uh, I'm sure the audience would be very happy to find out more about the course, whether they can take it and how, and uh, what was your, your take on this particular side of, of teaching? Do you honestly think there are also advantages to it? Martin, I believe you were the real uh, driving force with the MOOC. Want to talk about that? Um, sure. Um, I think it may. So I think, yes, I totally believe that there are also ad advantages. I mean, one advantage is what we're doing right now, uh, 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 you know, that you can just bring people together and reach people in different parts of the world. Um, um, but, it, you know, it's funny to think about, uh, I, I just remember how, how it started, this idea. Um, and I think the way it started was actually on, on a train ride. Uh, I, we bumped into each other uh, on Amtrak from Boston to New York. Uh, and I, you know, that's when MOOCs had just started. And I thought, oh, this is interesting here. I'm teaching world literature and thinking about world literature. And this would be a way to 
literally teach world literature to the world and engage the entire world rather than just the small, very privileged group of Harvard undergrads. And, you know, I love Harvard undergrads, but I always felt um, that somehow they're so privileged anyway, there's, there's so many resources devoted to them anyway, um, dissatisfied with that as sort of my primary uh, uh, student body. So anyway, so I thought it would be great uh, uh, about how would we do it. And then just as I was sort of ruminating, I ran into David on, on, on the train and we went to the uh, to the to, to the restaurant car, uh, not restaurant. Amtrak doesn't Cafe have car. Cafe cafeteria. Car. Uh, uh, um, um, and so we started to, I think, just sort of bounce around ideas, and um, and then we took it from there. David, do you? And, and, and to me, it was particularly pleasurable about that that MOOC is this kind of conversational quality. So that we ended up doing it just primarily. We would just sit at a table uh, and talk back and forth. And then we'd do also do interviews with friends and with students and colleagues and specialists uh, and so on. And, and, you know, and it was good and Harvard had good resources for, for getting images and, and, and the production values were, were, were really good. Uh, so I, I think that conversational quality, which, which I think also comes out in, in Martin's book and, and certainly I find the blog forum, it, is yeah. wonderful for this. I'm just having so much, uh, much fun with it. Uh, and also with the MOOC, as with this blog, I mean, the importance of images is, is very striking. Uh, and also Martin's book has a beautiful color insert with things and, and illustrations throughout. And this has been a big change, I think, a gradual change over my lifetime, M many more illustrations. And now with online things, you can just go to town and it explodes with uh, what you can do. Uh, so, so I think, I think there's a, a lot. And even though there's concern about the the epidemic will undoubtedly cause, you know, strains on hiring. Uh, and I worry about, you know, a few star professors uh, eating up the landscape. Uh, but if it's done well, a really good MOOC works really well with an in-person uh, class uh, discussion uh, with actual human beings together. Uh, so that's not just an either or, it's a really uh, biofeedback between the two, two modes. Yeah, so it would be a combination of, of both ways of, of teaching, which I, I think is, is one of the concerns that pretty much everybody right now is, is really sharing. If you, if you consider the universities are extraordinarily um, um, resilient uh, in this way, and there, there's no reason in nature why universities should continue to exist after the invention of print. Uh, you know, the, the, the old term a lecture simply mean you were reading uh, from the lectionary because the students couldn't have the manuscript. They hadn't, they were, you, the professor had the book. So once anyone can have the book, well then why do you even need a classroom anymore? Well, it caused then professors, self-protectively, but also I think for fun, to invent the seminar, which didn't exist before, in which you could assume that the students come with the book, having read it, able to read it. Completely different kind of thing. And I really think that the online teaching, if it's done well, should also reinvent the university in a much better way. I've actually been kind of radicalized by this uh, this uh, half semester we just had online. I don't want to go back to doing just two lectures a week. Uh, I want to, I'm actually, I really want to flip the classroom is increasingly happening, record the actual lecture. They can watch it whatever they want and then use the classroom time uh, better than just having them listen to me performing. Uh, well, sp speaking of, of, of this whole, you know, how the classroom is really working, uh, I do have a question related very much to the way my classes are really working right now. So it's a question that has to do um, with a very um, local reality. We're now actually uh, coming back home to our Ithaca. Um, and um, had a question actually related to um, the way the discipline is actually translated into Romanian. So um, since 1948, when uh, we had this uh, um, reform of the education, which was actually accompanying changing uh, from the Kingdom of Romania to the um, first popular republic slash communist. Um, in 1948, the name of the discipline uh, translating Goethe's Weltliteratur was Literatura Universala, so universal literature. Uh, 
even today, after 1989, uh, it's still the name of the discipline in textbooks, uh, even uh, it's the name of the discipline as being taught at the Faculty of Letters. There's a special section, it's universal and comparative literature. And I have been teaching for three years now uh, an MA class uh, at the Faculty of Letters in Bucharest, which is called How to Teach World Literature. And uh, the first thing we address is why is it that, you know, the discipline is actually called universal and why am I supposed to, to say it's literatura mondiale, so world literature. And I was wondering whether uh, um, you could talk a bit about the history behind the translation of, of, of the term and um, what does actually universal really entail and whether we should indeed uh, really change the name of the discipline as it is right now in Romania? Well, I think so David's new book comparing the literatures is really a, it's a fantastic history of the ideas and the people uh, and but also the institutionalization of comparative literature. So I think David really this is for you to answer. Well, I think, you know, of course, literature has a universal aspect. It's very, very important, but it seems like it's one side of the, of the story. If, if my eyes are correct, Nelly, I see behind you a volume of Borges. Uh, looks like I see his portrait there. And a yes, volume. yes, Essay. this one, yes. Um, which one is it? Is the essays or the stories? It's, uh, actually, it's the stories and it's the Penguin edition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he has, his first book had universal in the title, Historia Universal de la Infamia, what is universal is infamy. Uh, <laughs> uh, and of course he has a very uh, funny uh, and sharp essay from the early 50s about the Argentine writer and tradition. He says, well, he used to think that he had to really write about uh, the, the suburbs of Buenos Aires and use the local language and write about milongas and tango. Uh, and then once he started writing about mirrors and tigers, people said he finally got the flavor of, of Argentina correct. So, so he was saying, he, feel, he feels that the, the writer, uh, world culture, he says Western culture, but he's also interested in Japan, uh, is all his patrimony, is the world. At the same time, it is always local. There's always a dialectic between the universal and the local. Just today from my blog thing, I'm talking about uh, Dante. Uh, and you know, if Dante had wanted to write universal literature, he would have written the Commedia in Latin that would have been the universal language for him. So he writes in Italian and he invents this amazing Italian because he wants to be, to be writing for, for his own audience. Now that in turn, because it has these universal qualities, though grounded in the specificity of Florentine history, his own traumas, uh, the Italian language, it makes it universal. Um, so you can have Dante's Inferno now. This is the video game. Now this Ooh. is the, the, uh, the, the user's guide to the Dante's Inferno video game. Here Dante is like this buff hero now uh, with, with uh, a red cross on his pectoral muscles uh, and he's, he's brandishing a huge scythe here uh, uh, to, to, to vanquish demons in a kind of Boschian hell. He looks uh, like Sauron more to me. You know, that's interesting, yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, it becomes universally. He's everywhere now. Uh, now he's in the in the uh, uh, in the uh, internet sphere uh, in these ways, but it's it's. But if it wasn't also grounded, I think it would just ha have evaporated. Uh, so in terms of the history of the discipline, there's always been the back and forth. Uh, uh, it can be a kind of projection of French values outward. Uh, that's what really the universal often meant, including I think in a lot of countries such as Romania, in which the French culture was so important, and that's also why. At a certain point, if you were at a certain generation of Romanian intellectuals, you wanted to be universal, which meant to say you wanted to be taken seriously in France, even if you didn't get to emigrate necessarily, uh, as so many did. Uh, here I was just writing about Paul Chelan, uh, and he makes his career in Paris. Where else would you be? Even if you're writing in German, uh, you wouldn't want to be in Germany anymore, much less in, in Romania. You would want to be in Paris, uh, like so many others. So that's a kind of universal uh, thing. But I think now we're past that and can write the balance of the local and the universal perhaps perhaps better, which is why also even world literature should not be, just like comparing the literatures, my title is plural, it's not just one kind of comparison, one kind of literature, world literature should be world literature is in the plural, because it takes a different form in every country and even in, in every bookstore. Uh, uh, this 90 book collection would be probably different uh, in a Bucharest bookstore. 
No, definitely. And, and just, to, just to add to that, David, it, it's definitely very much in part our own, uh, uh, you know, French legacy, because, you know, since mid 19th century, we've always looked up to, you know, to Paris and to France as the forming culture. However, uh, this is why I mentioned this, uh, the uh, title universal literature is actually introduced in 48. So the other side of the story is that this is actually part of the, ideolog the, the ideologization of the uh, uh, communist party trying to really get its hands and its claws on the, the educational system. So this is more part of the uh, internationalism promoted by communism in the in the ex-Soviet mm -hmm. countries more than this this French thing. So it's more like what the Institute Maxim Gorky was doing, right? Which was for world literature, but we know it meant actually communism and, and internationalism, you know, from their point of view. And meant certain kinds of literature were therefore privileged as well, socialist realism. Obviously. Yeah, and, and just as a, as a footnote to that, there is this absolutely amazing uh, uh, article published in the uh, last but one issue of, of the Journal of World Literature. It's actually uh, signed by a, a former Harvard student of mine, Colton Valentine, and he's looking into uh, the trials of translating Goethe's Weltliteratur just in the first years after Goethe coins the term. And uh, my favorite is that in France, Le Globe, Le Globe, publishes it under the uh, translation um, Literature Européenne ou Occidentale. So it really kind of says it all. Um, anyway, but I was thinking since we just are going to run very quickly out of time, Raluca and Juana, do we have any interesting questions to take from the audience? Well, the qu first question was uh, what you asked Delia about the fact that in Romania we have universal literature, so that's been answered. Perfect. Good. Um, a former student from uh, the Institute of World Literature, Anna Marie Fischer, uh, added to this question uh, asking, uh, do you think we will see an academic transition from comparative literature to world literature? If so, when? And thank you all for the talk and greetings. Um, another question was from a student from Nepal. Okay, uh, should I stop and say afterwards or should I read all the questions? A few more maybe. Okay. Um, he's a student, he's, I am from Nepal and I am working on a modernist, revisionist me, uh, medieval fiction. You mentioned Dante and Homer and I am wondering what do you make of the role of ancient Sanskrit literature and uh, their role in shaping the ancient world literature. How important is Sanskrit literature and what other regions of the world have been influenced by Sanskrit, especially uh, the ancient world? Uh, another question is, there have been debates on whether or not social media is killing literature. What are your thoughts of that, on that? Is social media or the internet in general, for that matter, a threat to humanities? Um, we have someone who played the game uh, with Dante uh, and says it's very interesting and that the same things happened about uh, classic Persian literature. Uh, various video games have been developed based on them. And I think that's all for now. Mm -hmm. Great. Martin, some first thoughts. Um, maybe I'll take the, the internet uh, question first, because in a way that, that was another motivation for writing the, uh, uh, the written world uh, and its emphasis on writing technologies. I wanted to see what had happened at earlier moments when new technologies changed the way literature was written, read, distributed, uh, and so on and so forth, multiplied. Uh, and so that's why I looked at what happened when with the introduction of the alphabet or paper or early, the earlier versions of print, first in Asia, then in Europe, and so on and so forth. And I, I, it's true that these fundamental technologies really change very, very deeply. Who reads literature, how it is read, what kinds of stories get written. Uh, uh, these technologies have a very shaping power. So that intuition behind the fear, oh, is the internet going to destroy everything? Uh, I understand. But in the end, I think the conclusion was 
obviously not at these earlier moments that literature stopped, but that it changed. Uh, um, and in fundamental ways, and that it always took a while for the new technology to sort of, in a sense, work its way through the system and to uh, uh, and, and change. And there were winners and losers, and, and changes can be very disruptive and disorienting. But so I don't think that it's a negative change in the end, because among other things, the, the main difference with the internet uh, is that in with the print revolution, there was of course an explosion of, of literacy and, and more and more people had access to reading and writing, but the hurdle for becoming an author remained very, very high. So in a sense that, that, that the professional author as a figure uh, really emerges with the print revolution, you have relatively few authors and lots of readers. With the internet, everybody can become an author to the extent that almost maybe the notion of what an author is really changed or doesn't, doesn't make as much sense anymore. Uh, uh, there, different texts will be written by different people and different combinations, which was also, by the way, the case in the ancient world before the uh, uh, print revolution. So I think there are fundamental changes, but I think they are actually gonna be fascinating to watch. So for me, the internet, it's, it, this is an amazing moment to be interested in literature, I think, because we are, we are living through one of the very rare moments. There were maybe three or four other moments like that in the, his, in the last 4,000 years, the 4,000 years of literature. And so I think it's fascinating, but of course it's also disorienting and scary, and I understand that as well. I hear him at, uh, so, and I think there's, and there's a long history of people being worried about these terrible new technologies. I'm sure that, that uh, Martin has a wonderful chapter about the Greek alphabet and, and Homer, but I'm sure that there are people who, who just saw these texts and thought, what is this graphasis? We can't possibly get the beauty of Homer just sitting on the page. We need a performance. We, we need a floor show with dancing boys, uh, things that's, that, you, that you have described in Homer. And I remember Henry James has one of his prefaces uh, in which he has a diatribe against how writing has been vulgarized and cheapened by the invention of the steel pen. Because when you had to write with, with, a, with a feather, it was slower, it's more thoughtful. Now this kind of steel pen, it's harder, it's quicker, it's superficial. So th these things, the complaints never go away. Uh, so yeah, I think very much um, that uh, the internet offers new possibilities, including tremendous new possibilities for classic works. One of the things I talk about in my uh, recent the new, new, new book, the finished one is um, about, uh, and speaking of not Nepal, but of North India, uh, the great 19th century uh, Ghazal writer, uh, Ghalib. Um, uh, I have a friend at, at Columbia, um, uh, Francis Pritchard, who is a specialist in Urdu poetry, and, and she was going to do a, a three volume scholarly edition of all the Ghazals of Ghalib, sort of love poems. Uh, and it would probably have sold 500 copies to libraries. But then 9-11 happened and she decided that the world needed to know better this very cosmopolitan, beautiful poet. And she did a website, which is called A Desert Full of Roses. And if you look it up, it comes up right away uh, on Wikipedia. And, and it's fantastic because the internet allows her to have multiple transcriptions of different scripts, uh, multiple translations, performances of various of the songs, beautiful images. Uh, and she gets 10,000 hits per week uh, on her site from all over the world, uh, you know, a million every 16 months. So it's a whole new world for this 19th century poet that otherwise would have been known to a very few people outside, outside India. And I think that's true also the case of the influence of Sanskrit is now greater than ever because it can spread uh, all, over, all over the place. Just quickly on the question of comparative literature to world literature, you know, I think of myself, comparative literature is a good name for a discipline. It has historical roots. World literature, I think, was more of a framing device and approach. There are now starting to be programs in world literature, and it's good there's a journal of world literature. Uh, I don't mind at all the idea there's still the discipline, maybe broadly speaking, called comparative literature or theory and comparison or comparative and general literature, different names. Um, uh, okay with me, uh, but, uh, but I think world literature is something that's increasingly infusing not only comparative studies, but also increasingly studies in national traditions. So you'll get transnational French or English. Uh, and I think world literature, if we see it as something that, how does it come into a bookstore in Timotrari? Here is Romanian world literature. You don't need to be off in Asia to be talking about world literature, or even to be seeing Romanian literature in, in world terms. 
Raluca, Juana, do we have any more questions? Um, just another one popped up, but uh, Professor uh, Demrosh already answered uh, about the new way. Um, is this a new way if, uh, if the influence of literature on the new technology, but you answered already and gave well, well, let me a footnote that I answer. meant to say, uh, this can be a chance that, you know, the, Martin was just speaking of these rare changes. I think also, you know, in the late 19th and early 20th century, these, these sudden changes of um, photography and then film have had, had a huge impact. In a way, the internet is almost a follow on of that. And, and here, just a little shout out to Dahlia's new, new book on world literature and world film, which is, I've read the manuscript, and fantastically interesting uh, case studies from around the world of these filmmakers who themselves had literary training. Uh, and the kind of uh, very creative interplay back and forth today between, and it's been going on for decades, uh, and that the academics are the last to know, <laughs> partly because of the sort of self-protective disciplinary divisions. People in film studies were so concerned to make the integrity of their project, they would downplay the literary and particularly the dramatic connection. Uh, you know, and, and one thinks, I mean, someone like Ingmar Bergman, right, has spent as much of his time in theaters as making films and writes novels and amazing memoirs, no, he is a whole person that the university has divided into little, in little pieces. Uh, so really forward-looking work like Elias Notebook is really bringing these, these, these pieces back together. And this is really where I think comparative and intermedial work is going today. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, David, for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, response that ended in a very unexpected way for me. Um, however, I would like to... Uh, uh, pick up on what you and Martin said about how, you know, it's really literature that really teaches us more than any other theory, more than uh, any other methodology. And um, instead of the uh, standard, thank you, it's been such a pleasure having all of you here. Um, I actually have a, a small tribute to, to pay for everyone, for, especially to our hosts today, of course, Raluca and Juana, uh, and also to you and Martin. And I'm pretty sure you will understand why I, I, I picked this thing in particular, uh, which I actually owe today uh, for just being reminded of this particular poem to one of my freshman students, Madalina Zgraban. She's a very smart, very promising student. And it's a poem called Ithaca, and it's by our one and only Kavafi. As you set out for Ithaca, hope your road is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. Lestragonians, Cyclops, angry, Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. You will never find things like that on your way, as long as you keep your thoughts raised high, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Lestragonians, Cyclops, wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul, unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Hope your road is a long one. May there be many summer mornings when with that pleasure, what joy you enter harbors you're seeing for the first time. And may you visit many Egyptian cities to learn and go on learning from their scholars. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you are destined for. But don't hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years, so you're old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you have gained on the way, and expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you the marvelous journey. Without her, you would not have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become, so full of experience, you will have understood by then what these Ithakas mean. So I, I think all of us uh, did uh, understand what all these Ithakas mean. Uh, thank you so much, Martin. Thank you so much, David. And thank you, Juana and Raluca, for this amazing event. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. Very much. Thank, thank you so very much. much.